right, so we're going to do a quick tutorial on appreciation and depreciation of currency. I say quick, this may be, this may end up being 15 to 20 minutes. So you can certainly fast forward if you'd like. All right, first we've got to get down, uh, we have to understand some terminology. Okay, when we talk about uh, uh, currencies going up and down in value, we're really referring to exchange rates. Okay, now there's, there's this type, the fixed exchange rate which just means that a currency is held stable to the value of another currency. Um, so example, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong dollar has, for as long as I can remember, been $7.75. And or I'm sorry, it, it would take $7.75 of the Hong Kong dollar to buy one US dollar. And they just keep it pegged to that. So it's a fixed exchange rate. They manipulate the currency in order to do that. Then we have what's called the floating exchange rate. This is the one that we're studying. Okay, and this is where the value of a currency is dependent upon the, the laws of supply and demand. Okay. Appreciation simply means an increase in value. So when a currency goes up in price, it has appreciated. Depreciation will be just the opposite. The currency decreases in value. Then there's a couple other terms that mean the same thing. Okay. If a currency is appreciating, it is said to be a strong currency. So you've heard the term, the dollar is strong. Or you might have heard the dollar is weak. That's when the dollar is depreciating. Okay, and we're going to be focusing all of these things in what's called the foreign exchange markets. So this is the market where currencies are bought and sold. All right. So why would foreigners want U.S. dollars? Or, or you could ask conversely, why would American citizens like foreign currencies? Okay. So we'll just answer it based from from a foreigner, a foreigner's perspective with the U.S. dollar, okay? If a foreigner wanted to buy U.S. goods, they would first need to buy U.S. dollars, okay? American manufacturers don't accept euros or pesos or yen. So if you want to buy American goods and you live in another country, you first have to buy U.S. dollars. The reason that's important is because that leads to an increase in demand for that dollar. And anytime the demand for something goes up, you're going to have an increase in the price. Another reason foreigners might want to buy U.S. dollars would be to buy U.S. financial assets. So when we talk about these, we're talking about maybe bonds or stocks. Or they just want to put their money in a U.S. bank. Okay? And we'll probably concentrate on that one just because it's easy to imagine. Okay? Another reason foreigners might need some U.S. dollars Maybe they need to go visit Disneyland, okay? If you've ever been to Disneyland, you see a lot of foreign tourists there. In order for them to go there, they have to buy U.S. dollars, okay? To invest in the U.S., all right? This is, a, there's an example here. Um, and I, I'm sure I've brought this one up in class. Toyota built a plant where? Well, a bunch of places, but in Texas, they've got one in San Antonio. So in order for them to build a, a factory in San Antonio, they first had to exchange their yen for U.S. dollars so that they could build it. And then finally, as just a safe haven, you know, the U.S. is considered a safe place to keep your money, kind of like a like, you know, you've heard of the Swiss bank accounts; those are considered safe. Well, so are U.S. bank accounts. Okay, they're just not as anonymous. So a safe haven that would be another reason. So here is what we mean by the foreign exchange market. Okay. It's just a marketplace where currencies are traded. So if you want to go buy U.S. dollars or you want to go buy pesos or whatever, you have to go to this marketplace, okay? And so the market consists of a, of a supply and a demand for all the currencies. Now, let's not get confused. When we talk about the supply of the dollar, we are not talking about all dollars. We're not talking about all dollars. We're just talking about the dollars that are in the foreign exchange market. So it doesn't include the dollars that are in our pockets. So don't think of it that way. All right, so here's our analogy. Um, the foreign exchange market is, is a market where currencies are traded. So, for example, if you wanted to go on vacation in Mexico, you, you would need to buy some pesos. So you go to Walden, that's me right up here, I'm the cashier, and you demand pesos. So what happens is the demand for pesos increases, and what happens to the price of the peso? It goes up, okay? 
Now, I'm not just going to give you pesos. You have to give me dollars in return. And so when you give me those dollars, I'm going to put those dollars back behind the counter in a little box. And so the supply of the dollar has increased in the foreign exchange market. There's not necessarily more dollars in the world, but in the foreign exchange market, there are more of them. And so the price of the dollar has now gone down. So that's kind of a, a little, in a nutshell, what we mean by the foreign exchange market. Okay? So here's an example of why this matters. Okay? Y'all y'all probably know Hans and Franz, right? So training sessions with Hans and Franz cost 100 euros. In case you don't know, Hans and Franz are Austrian. So they, they require euros as payment for, for their services. So as an example, whenever one dollar will buy one euro, that means you would need $100 to buy 100 euros, and so their training sessions would cost $100. Okay? What if it now, a dollar would only buy 0.80 euros, or 80 you know, cent euros, whatever you want to call it? Would it now cost more or less to get lessons from Hans and Franz? Well, let's figure this out. This is something that you all need to know how to do. The way you would figure out what it cost in dollars is you would take the 100 euros and divide by how many euros a dollar will buy, 0.80. Okay? And when you do that, you're going to get $125. So when the dollar went from buying 1 euro to 0.8 euros, the dollar got weak and the euro got strong. So whenever the dollar is weak, that means foreign goods and services will cost more for Americans to buy. Okay? What if now a dollar will buy one and a half euros? Okay? Now, because the services cost 100 euros, you're just going to divide by one and a half now. And that's going to give you $67. So whenever currencies go up and down in value, that means that the price of foreign goods, exports and imports, everything will change in terms of your own currency. So that's why this is important for us to understand. Okay? Now, here's some, here's some more little rules, if you, if you will. Sometimes you'll be asked about one currency, but you're given information about a different currency. So it's, it's, it's good to note that if you understand what's happening with one currency, with one currency, the exact opposite thing happens with the other one. So for example, okay, um, if I decide to go on vacation in Europe, I would first have to buy euros. That means the demand for euros will increase. Okay, so that's this. So if the demand for euros increase, that means the supply of the dollar will increase. In a way, that's an opposite uh, opposite reaction. The demand from one graph shifted right, the supply in the other one shifted right. So that's an example of opposites. Okay. Here's another thing to think about. Uh, if you if if I was say a Canadian, and I was trying to decide if I wanted to go on vacation in Europe or in the USA, well, maybe I decide I'm going to go on vacation in the USA. I would need to demand U.S. dollars. But then I wouldn't demand as many euros, okay? So in this case, the demand increased in one, but the demand in the other graph decre decreased, okay? That's one way to think of that. Another thing, let's, let's erase these. This gets too complicated here. This is probably the most important thing to remember, okay? And that is this. Let's say, for example, uh, the supply of the dollar increases because I'm buying things from Europe, and the demand for the euro increases, okay? What happens here is that the dollar depreciates, but when the dollar depreciates, that means the euro has to appreciate every single time. If you're comparing two currencies, if the value of one increases, that means the value of the other one decreases. So this is going to be important, okay? So here are, here are if, you're, if you like rules, okay, and we'll explain these rules as we go, but if you like rules, you should write these things down and then refer to it until you feel comfortable. Okay? These are things that will appreciate a currency. Okay? An increase in taste for a nation's goods. Okay? 
that, that will increase the demand for the currency. So if we're thinking dollars, for example, people want American products, they have to demand more U.S. dollars first. Okay, higher interest rates. Um, this, would, this would be where we're talking about financial assets. Okay, if U.S. interest rates are higher than in other countries, then foreigners would like to put their financial capital in the United States to earn the higher interest rates. So when interest rates are higher, it increases the demand for a currency. Okay? This PL, that stands for price level. So you could think in, in you could think about inflation. Okay? If prices are, are lower in the US than they are in other countries, that will create an increase in demand for the US dollar to pay for the increased exports that are created by our lower prices, okay? Decrease in income, now this is a little bit different, okay? If the U.S. income, you know, if our average incomes drop, we buy less from other countries. We go visit other countries less. And whenever that happens, we're, that means we're gonna supply fewer of our dollars, okay? And then lastly, political stability. If, if, if our, you know, government is safe and, and you know, our country's considered safe, put your, do your uh, money in, it would increase the demand for U.S. dollars, okay? Then we have all the opposites over here. Depreciation of a currency. Now you're talking about a decrease in taste for the for nation's goods. That means you'll have less demand for their currency. Lower interest rates results in less demand for their currency. Higher prices, less demand for currency. Increase in income. Now, if our incomes are higher, we will be supplying our dollars in the foreign exchange market because we're buying goods across the world. And then finally, political instability. That would create less demand for a currency. All right. So let's, let's do some examples. And also, uh, this is extremely important. Make note of how you draw the foreign exchange market graph, okay? So it says here that I'm going to buy a Porsche. If I buy a Porsche, they're made in Germany, that means I need to buy euros. So first thing I'm gonna do, I'm going to label my graph, foreign exchange for the euro. It is a supply curve, a demand curve. Well, the, the best way to do this is put quantity of euros, okay? And then the price, this is the part that's probably the most confusing. You need to, you need to price them as dollars per euro. So just draw it like that. Now we're also gonna compare what happens with the US dollar. So I'm gonna draw that graph down here. We've got 4X for the dollar. We've got supply, we've got demand, we've got the quantity of dollars. And over here, now we price it as euros per dollar. All right, cool. So what's gonna happen? If I, if I need that Porsche, first I gotta go to the foreign exchange market and I gotta buy some euros. So that leads to an increase in demand for the euro, which means the euro has now appreciated. Now we learned a little while ago that everything does the, in, does, will do the opposite, okay? If the euro has appreciated, that means the dollar has to depreciate. So how do we make it depreciate? Well, the, the common sense thing is this. If I go to the foreign exchange market to buy euros, I'm replacing those euros in the foreign exchange market with US dollars. So it creates an increase in the supply of the U.S. dollar, okay? So that's, that's an example where taste for a nation's goods has a direct effect on, the na on that nation's currency value, okay? I wanted a Porsche, the Euro increased in value. All right, next, taste for a nation's goods. All right, here's, we'll do just the opposite, okay? Again, we've got the Euro taking some shorthand here now, okay? Uh, we price it as dollars per euro, supply, demand, quantity of euros, and now we're pricing the dollar at euros per dollar. You have supply, you have demand, you have quantity of dollars, okay? So now, Americans don't like the French goods. We don't want any of their stuff. So if we don't want to buy French goods, that means we don't need to buy euros. Euro would depreciate, okay? And if we're not buying their goods, that means we're not supplying our own. 
Okay, so the supply of the U.S. dollar will go down in the foreign exchange market, which means our currency would then appreciate. Okay, now we've got our, our income or our growth rate. You know, if the economy is doing well, that means we're going to be buying more U.S. goods, but we're also going to buy more foreign goods. So anytime our growth rate is increasing relative to other nations or our income is going up, now there's going to be an inverse relationship between our income and the value of our currency. Okay? So I'm going to compare the dollar with the yen. So we've got the yen market here, quantity of yen. Dollars per yen is how we price the yen. And we're going we're to do the opposite reaction over here with the dollar. Quantity of dollars. And then the price is yen per dollar. Okay? So on this one, because we have increased income, we're going to go out and we're going to buy a whole bunch of Japanese goods. So in order to do that, we increase our demand for those goods. That's going to cause the yen to appreciate. At the same time, we have to supply more of our own currency. And that causes the dollar to depreciate. So that's why there's an inverse relationship. When our, our income went up, the value of our dollar went down. So that's what we mean by inverse. All right. And then the, the exact opposite here. If the U.S. is in recession while the rest of the world may not be, then the exact opposite is going to happen. Okay, we've got yen, we've got dollar, supply, demand, quantity of dollars, and we've got the quantity of yen, supply, demand. Let's see, it's price dollar per yen. You should practice this as much as you can because you will lose points if you don't get this part right. Okay? So now, since we, we've lost our jobs, okay, we're not buying as many foreign goods, including Japanese goods. So we've decreased our demand for the yen. That depreciates the yen. At the same time, we've decreased the supply of the U.S. dollar, which appreciates the U.S. dollar. Again, that demonstrates the inverse relationship between our income and the value of our currency. Our income went down, but our, the value of our currency went higher. All right, interest rates. So th the easiest way to think about interest rates is this. Okay, it, what, fit, what 50 cents says, okay? He's got 50 cents, he wants to put his money in the bank. Interest rates in the U.S. are 5%. Interest rates in Canada are 10%. Well, if you had a bunch of money you had to put in the bank, would you want to earn 10% or 5% interest? Obviously, 10%. So we're going to show an effect on the Canadian dollar versus the U.S. dollar, okay? And over here, we've got it priced as U.S. dollars per Canadian dollar, supply, demand, it's a quantity of the Canadian dollar. Over here, we've got the Canadian dollar per U.S. dollar, supply, demand, and quantity of the U.S. dollar. Okay, just to be very precise. Now, 50 cents, he decides he wants to put his money in the Canadian bank. So he's going to go to the foreign exchange market, and he's going to increase his demand for Canadian dollars. He can't put U.S. dollars in the Canadian bank. He's got to exchange his U.S. dollars for Canadian dollars. So the higher interest rates in Canada drives up the value of the Canadian dollar. Okay? The lower interest rates in the U.S. are going to de depreciate the value of the U.S. dollar. Okay? Now, not to confuse anybody, but we could also do this in exactly the opposite way from maybe the Canadian perspective. Okay, if Canadians see that interest rates are lower in the U.S., they would demand fewer U.S. dollars and supply fewer of their own. Okay? It doesn't really matter which curve you, you decide to move as long as it makes sense. Um, for me, for us, I think it's easiest if we concentrate on moving the demand curve in the currency we're talking about because it just, it just is more intuitive. Okay, so if we're asking what happens to the value of the Canadian dollar, move the, the demand curve for the Canadian dollar. Okay? All right, next, price level. That means inflation. Uh, it says that Mexico is having a sale. All right, 
They, they've lowered the prices of everything to encourage people to go visit Mexico or to buy Mexican goods. So let's see how that affects the value of the peso. And we price it as dollars per peso. Okay. And then we'll put the U.S. dollar over here. Quantity of dollar. And we price it as pesos per dollar. Okay. Now, it says here that they're having a sale. So are we going to we going to buy some of their stuff since it's on sale? Yeah, we are. So we increase our demand for the peso. That drives the peso higher. In order to pay for those pesos, we have to increase the supply of our own dollar in the foreign exchange market, which drives down the price of the dollar. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Now we'll look at political instability or political stability. Either way, if there's a direct relationship between a nation's stability and the value of its currency. Okay, this is that safe haven thing I was, I was speaking of earlier. So it says here that uh, Messi is a little bit worried about the Spanish government. You know, they're, they're, they're getting a little bit crazy over there in Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Greece. Um, it, it's just, it's not, a, it's not a good thing. If, if you have a lot of money, you don't want to keep it there. So he's thinking he might want to move his, his money to the USA. So let's see how that affects the value of the dollar and the euro. price the dollar in terms of euros, so it's euros per dollar, and then over here we'll draw the euro, you've got supply, you've got demand, you've got quantity of euro, and it's priced as dollars per euro, okay? So Messi decides he wants to take his mi millions and millions of euros and put them in U.S. banks because it's safer. So he's got to go to the foreign exchange market, he's got to increase his demand for the dollar, driving the dollar higher. Stability in the U.S. Will, will make the dollar strong. At the same time, he is supplying more of his own currency in the foreign exchange market, driving the euro lower. Okay? So I think we've covered all of those rules. Now here's our next question. Is it better to have a strong or a weak dollar from, from a U.S. perspective? Is it better to have a strong or a weak dollar? If you've answered, your answer should have been, that's right, it depends, okay? So we're going to look at, at why it depends, okay? And we'll use the price of this Kia as, as, our, as our reasoning, okay? This, pre, uh, this Kia costs 12 million won. Won is the South Korean currency. And so if you wanted to buy this Kia, you don't pay in dollars, you pay in won. Now, obviously, um, you know, we don't actually buy cars with foreign currency, but the dealers or the distributors that sell to the dealers, they do, okay? And so we're going to see what this car costs at all these different exchange rates. These, by the way, these exchange rates are real exchange rates that I've tracked over time. So we're going to see what that car costs at each of those periods in time. All right, so how do we calculate the, ex the actual dollar value of the car? If you'll remember from Hans and Franz, we're going to take our 12 million won price, and we divide by the number of won that you can buy for a dollar. When we do that, we're going to get roughly $6,667 is what that car costs. Now we'll do it again. In September of 2009, the wand, it looks like the wand got stronger because the dollar will not buy as many of them. Okay, if the dollar won't buy as many wand as it used to, then the dollar got weaker, and that means the wand got stronger. So let's see what the price of the car became for Americans who would like to buy it. Now it's 1200 So the price of the car now is $10,000. If you were buying that car, would you want to buy it in February or September of 2009? Okay, keep that in mind. Then it looks like the, the dollar got stronger again. It'll buy 1,600 won. So in February 2010, it 
looks like now you could buy the car for $7,500, okay, U.S. dollars. Then in September 2011, you take your 12 million won, divide by the number of won you can buy with a dollar. I got to do this. I can't do this in my head. One, two, zero, 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 zero divided by 1100. So now you can buy the the car for ten thousand nine oh nine. Okay, and we'll do the last one. Uh, Twelve million won divided by one zero eight six one gives us eleven thousand forty nine dollars. So that's what the car cost during each of those time periods in terms of dollars. Every single time it still costs 12 million won. So let's look at the hamsters. It says that they are stoked that they bought their Kia in February of 2009. Why are they so happy about that? They're happy because at that point in time, the dollar was strong. And so they only had to pay this many dollars for the car. So that's a good thing for them. Now, these are the guys that built the cars. These are, these are South Korean factory workers. And they had a conversation one day that went something like this. Okay, uh, I, I think his name was Pete. Pete says, I sure do miss the good old days of February 2009. And then Robert says, why? Well, this is the part where sometimes we, we get confused. And we're like, well, wouldn't they rather get more dollars for the car? See, these guys down here... These guys don't care. Okay, he doesn't care. He doesn't care what the dollar price is. Well, he sort of does, but he's getting 12 million won for the car. Okay. For him, it, 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 I mean, it's immaterial how many dollars it is. It's how many won he's getting. He's still getting 12 million won, no, no matter what the dollar price is. The question, though, is this: He misses February of 2009 because. Do you think they were selling more cars to America in February 2009 or in February 2015? I mean, let's look at look at your prices here. Okay. Which time period is, is he selling more cars? So this kind of answers a little bit of our question about it depends whether a strong or a weak currency is good. If you're these guys, they would like a weak yuan because they're selling cars to Americans. So they would like a strong dollar. Okay, If you're buying foreign goods, you want a strong dollar. If you're selling American goods to foreigners, you want a weak dollar. So that's why this is important for us. Okay, When the dollar gets weak, our exports will increase. When the dollar is strong, our imports will increase. So let's do another example here. Justin Bieber gets deported and takes all his money back to Canada. Okay, We may or may not be excited about that. So let's see how that affects the value of, of the Canadian dollar, okay? So this is the Canadian dollar graph. You have supply, you have demand, you have the quantity of the Canadian dollar, and it's priced in U.S. dollar per Canadian dollar, okay? Now, how, how is this going to affect things? If he's taking all of his U.S. dollars and putting them in Canadian banks, that means he has to convert his U.S. currency into Canadian currency. So he goes to the foreign exchange market and he increases the demand for the Canadian dollar, therefore driving the price higher. Okay. When the price of the Canadian dollar goes up, what happens to the prices Americans have to pay for maple syrup from Canada? Okay. Well, now it's going to take more dollars to buy Canadian dollars, therefore the price of Canadian maple syrup is going to go higher. So what then would happen to, to Canada's exports? If the price of their goods are now higher for Americans, then their exports are going to go down. Okay? Here's another example. Actually, let's back it up. Are we, have, yeah, I think we're, we've covered everything there. Another example. Megan Trainer. she increases her purchases of bass from Djibouti. She's got that song all about that bass. So if she wants to buy Djibouti bass, she's got to first go and she's got to buy some Djibouti booty, supply, demand, the quantity of booty, and we'll price these as dollars per 
booty. Okay. Fun fact, their currency isn't really called the booty. Um, it's called the franc. So how's the demand for the booty affected in the foreign exchange market? Well, if she, if she wants to buy more Baskin's booty, she first has to buy their currency. So the demand increases. That's going to drive the price of the booty higher. Okay. So that means the booty has appreciated. If the booty appreciates, what happens to the American dollar? Okay. We know that it, it always goes opposite. So the American dollar will depreciate. If the booty appreciates, the dollar depreciates. That means it now takes more dollars to buy booties. Okay. And what happens to the price then that foreigners would have to pay for U.S. goods? If we're, we're taking this a little bit backwards. So since the dollar costs less, now foreigners can buy more U.S. goods because the price of those U.S. goods would go lower. And if our prices are now lower as a result of a depreciated currency, that means our exports are going to go up. And our imports, since our dollar is now worth less, we won't be able to buy as many foreign goods. So our, ex our imports would go down. So is it better to have a stronger weak dollar? It depends. Okay, the answer is always it depends. If let's use some examples. If you are selling goods to foreigners, the answer is you would like a weak dollar. Okay? If instead of selling goods to foreigners, you're buying goods from foreigners, then you would like a strong dollar. Okay. Um, if you're visiting a foreign country, you would like a strong dollar. If you're if you work in the tourism industry in the United States, you would like a weak dollar. So it just all depends. Okay. The the key here is that we want a stable dollar. A stable dollar is easier to plan for and everything's good with a stable dollar. So that's really what we're trying to do. All right, so here's some examples of uh, AP style questions. So if you're not interested in these, you can, you can cut out now, but I'm gonna keep going. So if Mexicans increase their investment in the US, the supply of Mexican pesos to the foreign exchange market and the dollar price of the peso will most likely change in which of the following ways. Let's draw a graph. Every single time you have a question, and, and there's a graph that can be drawn, you could draw that graph, okay? So we're gonna draw the peso market because that's what it's talking about, okay? And we price pesos as dollars per peso and I always title my graph pesos. All right, so if Mexicans increase their investment in the U.S., so if they increase their investment in the U.S., they need to buy dollars, okay? So when they're buying dollars, that means they have to supply more of their own currency, and that drives the price lower. So that's the dollar price of the peso, by the way. See how this dollar price of peso, dollar price of peso, okay? Uh, so the supply of the pesos increases, right? And the price of the peso is going to decrease. So there's our answer, B, okay? Number two, if the real interest rate in Canada increases relative to the real interest rate in Japan, and there are no trade barriers between the two countries, then for Canada, which of the following will be true of its financial capital, the value of its currency, and its exports? So when we talk about financial capital, we're, we're not talking about real capital. You gotta remember the difference here. Real capital is gonna be machines and factories. Financial capital is just money, okay? So the money, is, it's kinda like water. Water will seek you know, the lowest point, well, money will always seek the highest interest rate. So capital flow is gonna move toward uh, Canada, okay? So Canada, which is one of the, wait a minute, if the real interest rate in Canada increases relative to real, yeah. So financial capital is gonna flow to Canada. So that'd be an inflow. And then their currency is gonna do what? Let's draw it out. You got supply, you got demand quantity of the Canadian dollar. Uh, we're pricing it as yen per Canadian dollar. And the graph is the Canadian dollar. 
So in order th with the higher interest rates, the currency is going to appreciate. We already know that because it, that's our rule. Why does it appreciate? Because with higher interest rates, people will want to put their financial assets in the country that has the higher interest rates. So the demand for the Canadian dollar is going to increase, thereby appreciating the currency. So our answer is going to be capital is going to flow into Canada, causing Canadian currency to appreciate. And then if their currency appreciates, their goods become more expensive, therefore their exports will decrease. Okay? All right, last slide. Here is an example of a pre-response question. This is a great question that could you could see on an exam or even just a daily quiz or a major course. So the real interest rates in the U.S. and Japan are equal to 7%. The real interest rate in the U.S. increases to 8%, while the real interest rate in Japan decreases to 6%. How and why will capital flows be affected by this change in real interest rates? So again, you got your reminder here. It's financial capital, not real capital. Okay. So the answer here is that uh, it will flow to the U.S. Now, it says how and why. So we've got to understand the how and the why, okay? Or the why, rather. We've done the how. It'll flow to the U.S. And then why? Because financial investors seek high returns, okay? And of course, the higher interest rate will will give higher returns. Now it says, using a correctly labeled graph for the yen market, show and explain how the value of the yen will change relative to the value of the dollar. All right, so we've got to draw the yen market. If it helps, you can always draw both, okay? price it as dollars per yen, okay? And it says that it's going to flow to the U.S. So in order for Japanese people to put their financial capital in the U.S., they have to increase the supply of their financial capital in the foreign exchange markets. Now, I said you can draw the other graph if it makes it easier for you to think this through. So if we draw the dollar market, supply, demand, quantity of dollars, price yen per dollar, okay? In order for them to put their, their money in U.S. banks, they have to demand more dollars. That makes the dollar appreciate. So if, if it's easier for you to think about the demand for the dollar first, go ahead and do that. Then you can look at the yen. The yen depreciates, okay? So the, the, we just did the show by drawing a graph. Now we explain, okay? Um, the explain is basically, uh, I'm not going to write this out, I'll just say it. Uh, financial of investors seeking higher rates of return are going to increase their demand for the U.S. dollar and supply more of the yen in the foreign exchange market, thereby depreciating the yen, okay? And then explain how the change in the value of the yen will affect each of the following in the U.S. All right. So the yen is now less expensive. So we're going to increase our imports from Japan. And we're going to decrease our exports to Japan. Now it said explain. So the explanation on both of these is because U.S. goods become relatively more expensive to Japanese consumers. And I'm not going to write it out, but you would also say the opposite you would say Japanese goods become relatively less expensive for U.S. consumers. And that's how you would get full credit on this uh, question. 